Lord, let's give God some praise in this place. I believe that God is here, and I believe that the Holy Spirit is definitely here in this place this morning. Can I get an amen? So, God, I just want to thank you for your people and the love that they experienced this morning. You know what they needed when they needed it. So, God, we thank you for showing up this morning. Amen. So, can we all stand for the reading of the word? We're going to go straight into the main text this morning. And the main text is coming from 2 Corinthians 13, verses 5 through 7. And it's on the screen. It says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? And trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong, not so that people will see that we have stood the test, but so that you will do what is right, even though we may have seen to fail. With all heads bowed, God, I just want to thank you for your presence in this room this morning. God, I want to thank you for the word that you've deposited for your people this morning, Father God. I pray that I would increase, uh, that I would decrease and you would increase, Father God. Holy Spirit, you speak through me. God, I thank you for your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. You may all be seated. So if I would have tied a topic to this text this morning, it would simply be, growing pains growing pains and when i sat with this word and i sat with this piece of scripture the first thing when i was in prayer that came to my mind was the first question that came to my mind was when people see me what do they see when people see you what do they see now, you see, I didn't realize how powerful this question was until I had to ask myself the question. Like, Angelique, when people see you, what do they see? And in that moment, I began to take a step back from how I viewed myself. Because how many of you know how you view yourself is in how people view you? You may have a completely different version of yourself in your head, thinking you're the best of the bunch, and somebody else just think you playing raggedy. When they see you coming through the hallway, they're like, Lord, not that person, right? But you're thinking, oh, yeah, I brighten up everybody's day, right? So how you view yourself may not be how people view you. So I had to take a step back from how I viewed myself, and I had to really examine how I show up every day, how I interact with persons daily, how I respond to frustrations, how are my daily actions, and how is my life? affecting people what do people see when they see me what do people see when they see you do they see progress or do they see somebody stuck in the same cycle dealing with the same habits do they see someone who is kind and shows love or do they see somebody with a screwed face that nobody wants to deal with because you just simply rude and you don't know what to say and if somebody was to be honest and tell you the truth, your life, it, it, it's not giving Jesus. It, it's not giving love. It's not giving what it's supposed to give. So how many of you know what people see when they see you? It's important. And I'm not talking about the lies that people may say about you. We're talking about the truth here today. Because God doesn't care about the lies. God knows the truth, right? And I believe some of us get so caught up sometimes. Oh, this person lying on me and oh, all the things they gossiping about me and saying about me that ain't true. Listen, get rid of all of that. What's the truth? <laughs> so it matters what people see, especially when you claim to love God and have a relationship with him. Because if you have a relationship with God, one thing people should see when they see you for sure is growth. Somebody say growth. But growth doesn't come without growing pains. How many of you know that it's painful to grow? Amen? Is it painful to grow? When you're a kid and you have growing pains, though, 
you always have something to show for it, whether it be a new tooth, whether it be you're growing taller. The growing pains may be uncomfortable, but the pain is necessary to make room for the new, to make room for the growth. Someone say growth. When you have spiritual growing pains, God is paving the way then for something new. Whether that be new wisdom, whether that be new patience, whether that be more self-control. The Bible teaches us that God uses life experiences to shape us. Life experiences to shape us and help us to grow. Somebody say grow. Because when we become more mature, we are able to make a greater impact in the lives around us. The pain is there to tell us that it's time to change. Somebody say it's time to change. The you people knew in 2022 should not be the you people know in 2023. The mistakes you made in 2022 should not be the same mistakes you're making in 2023 because growth means you're changing growth means you're evolving not even year by year but day by day so the you that you saw yesterday shouldn't be the you that is coming into today amen people should see your life and they should automatically say no for sure that person is growing that person has changed sister Charlene is growing brother Eddie is growing brother Jay is growing they should have no doubt in their mind when they see you that you're growing. That person has changed. They don't talk the same anymore. They don't act the same anymore. I can't come to them in my foolishness anymore. I can't do it because there's a light in them that I see that they've grown and that they've changed. Somebody say I'm growing. So when I asked myself this question, and you know, I took a look back over the years, I'm proud to say, you know, who I am now is not who I once was five years ago, two years ago, even a year ago. Somebody say, thank the Lord for deliverance. <laughs> because when I just think a little back about, you know, the old me, I'm just like, Lord, thank you for your grace. <laughs> so I'm not the same person. What people saw then, they don't see now. The drink until I was drunk me, they saw back then, they don't see now the girl who never wore any clothes back then they don't see that same girl now amen <laughs> the girl who was looking for love in all the wrong places that they saw back then they don't see now because when god takes a hold of your life and you are fully surrendered to him he changes you he stretches you he grows you through the pain of these changes. Amen? In his word, it says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Anybody thankful for the new you? Anybody thankful for God's grace and the way that he changed you? But, you know, we need to address something real quick. Why do we like to give people this refined version of us, this refined version of our testimony, this refined version of our past? Like you've been saved your entire life. Like you've never been through anything. Like you've always been perfect. Like your family is perfect. Like your marriage is perfect. How are people supposed to be set free if we don't talk about the growing pains in life? We need to tell people, no, growing is painful. Sacrifice is painful. Obedience is painful. So what I talked about just now didn't happen overnight, nor was it easy for me to make this decision. But the pain leads you to the promise. The pain pushes you to purpose if you allow it. People should look at your life and they should really be like, wow. Who is that God? He over there serving. Who is that God? He over there serving because, I mean, they're really over there growing and they're flourishing. Who is that God that they're serving? They shouldn't look at your life and be like, oh, Lana, who that God is that they over there serving because I don't want no parts of that and what they're doing over there. Because they're saying one thing, but then they, anyway, we're going to get to that soon. They shouldn't see your life and not recognize God in it. 
Because your life is a testimony. Testimony meaning evidence or proof of something. So then your life should show evidence. If you say God is within you, your life should show evidence that what? God is within you. Amen? So the great part is, though, you get to choose if it'll be a testimony of growing through the pains or a testimony of no growth at all. So let's get back to the text. Amen? Getting a little heavy. Let's get back to the text, lighten it up a little bit. So 2 Corinthians 13, verses 5, it says, examine yourself. Someone say examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? So in Paul's final words to this group of believers in Corinth, I note Paul was talking to who? Believers. Paul wasn't talking to sinners. He was talking to believers. He was talking to the church of Corinth. Amen? And also note, when I was studying, I realized that Paul wrote about four letters to the same church. And I've heard some people say, you know, the church of Corinth kind of is like how it, how it is right now in these times and days, right? So he wrote to the church of Corinth four times. Four times. Because you know anything that's growing is, pa is painful to do, right? So you don't think that it was painful for him to write a letter again and then another letter again and another letter again to the same church in Corinth. It's, it's, it's tiring, y'all. Don't think Paul was tired. But I mean, you know, that's why you got to respect pastors of the church because, I mean, it, it's tiring. <laughs> it's tiring. Like, but Paul didn't want to give up on them, and, and that's where grace comes in, right? So he wrote about four letters to the church in Corinth. So Paul was ch challenging them to test themselves and examine their hearts and behaviors to see if they were truly living the life of faith. These believers were encouraged to examine their heart to be sure that their faith was founded on Christ and that their witness was true and not counterfeit. Counterfeit meaning fake. Someone say stop faking. So what is it important for us to examine, number one, our hearts, and number two, our behaviors? So while I was studying about this message, you know, the Holy Spirit dropped in my spirit that a common excuse we use these days is, oh, God knows my heart. It almost has become second nature to some of us. The minute we mess up, the minute we say something we know we shouldn't have said, what do we say? Oh, but God knows my heart. <laughs> so I've been talking about people all my life. But you know, oh, God knows my heart, right? We say we going out to this party, and you know, just once or twice we go in, um, you know, to answer this phone call from homeboy and homegirl. We going by that house once or twice, you know, I'm not going to do anything. And then you end up doing something, and then it's like, oh, but God knew my heart? <laughs> I can't help my attitude. I can't help the way I talk to people. But, you know, what do we say? God knows my heart. Someone say, God knows my heart. I know that doing this thing or saying this thing was out of order, but I meant well. So, God knows my heart. The Bible does agree that God knows your heart because God said to Samuel that he sees not as man sees. First Samuel 16, verses 7, it says, Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. We love to say that. But the Bible also says in Jeremiah 17, verses 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. Our heart is deceitful and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Meaning even you can understand your own heart. The heart is where your shady desires, your shady intentions, your shady passions, they live there. So then, your heart doesn't justify you. Rather, 
your heart condemns you. So really, your actions testify against your heart. Jesus said, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. So you can't use profanity. And when someone calls you out on it, you say, oh, but God knows my heart. Where did the profanity come from? Your heart. Don't worry, this is going to be a tough message today. I can't prepare to, to shout pay on, all right? All right? So <laughs> your heart is the place where that came from. If you're living with someone you're not married to, the excuse that God knows your heart just won't cut it. I'm sorry. Your sexual immorality is the product of your unclean heart. How many of you know on Judgment Day, we can't tell Jesus, we can't tell God, oh, but I thought that you knew my heart. He going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you, and I never said that. That's what he's going to say. So if you was wondering, that, that'll be a little bit of what you're getting, all right? So get, get this, get this. If you write a note, take this down. You don't sin in spite of having a clean heart. You sin because there is something wrong in your heart. Someone say, check your heart. So we shouldn't look to our hearts for justification, but we should look to the cross and carry the things that are in our heart that is not of God to the cross daily then, amen? We need to cry out to God like David cried out, oh, what did he say? Oh, create in me a clean heart because he know that there was nothing good in his heart. But nothing will change until you do. No growth will happen until you decide that you want to grow. Until you realize, yes, I have a problem here and you make the decision to wake up every single morning and be intentional about crucifying that thing that is not of God within you. Someone say, be intentional. So I ask myself then, why do some people stop growing? Because it seems like, you know, they're on a roll, they're on a ball, and then it's just like all of a sudden they just stop. And it's like you born big because ain't nothing else happening, right? So I ask myself, why do people stop growing? Do they not experience growing pains anymore that should make them not want to stay where they are? But the truth is, some of us get so comfortable right where we at. If you can't say amen, just say ouch now. We ignore the pain that God presents to get our attention and result. We never grow. So you've been bucking your toe with the same situation for years. And some of us have the audacity to be crying about it and complaining about it. The audacity to cry about it and complain about it to God, to your friends. Oh, I don't know what the problem is. I don't know why this always happens to me every single year around the same time. And I just don't know, like, what the problem is and why God doing this to me. The problem is you. The problem is you don't want to do the work to check your heart. So our pains are supposed to lead us closer to God and expose what is really on the inside of us. Because the more you grow, you is flash, the more you have to sacrifice. It's not easy. Growing isn't easy. The more you'll get corrected, the more you should examine yourself. The more you grow, there is more that's required of you. So if you're not willing to do that, then baby, it's okay, you'll just stay stuck. Unfortunately, you'll just stay stuck. So principle number one is, if you're taking notes, growing pains require us to check our heart. Someone say, check your heart. Let's move on to principle number two. Growing pains require us to what? Check our behaviors. So you want to know what is the best way to test yourself? And know if you are really a Christian, if you really have that relationship with God, if you're really in the faith, when you begin to not be only hearers of the word, but doers. And you know, I know we say that all the time. Oh, yes, I hear the word and 
gas, I want to do it, and yes, like all you do is talk, talk, talk. But then it's like you never do anything. You saying all this you're doing for God and all this you're doing unto the Lord, why don't you stop talking about it and actually do it then? Because if you are in the word and the word is in you, then your life should be producing a thing we called fruit. So I'm so thankful to God that he didn't leave us alone. How many of you know he didn't leave us alone? He didn't leave us alone. Who did he leave us with? The Holy Spirit, which is what? Our helper. Right? And if the Holy Spirit is at work within us, he will help you get your life right. This isn't a walk that we have to do alone. He sent somebody to help us. So we know that the Holy Spirit is within us by the fruits of the Spirit. Someone say, check your fruit. And I don't mean check your fruit once a month or check your fruit whenever you feel like checking your fruit. You need to check your fruit every single day. It's hard working. So then let's talk a little bit about what are the fruits of the Spirit because you might not know. So I'm here to tell you. All right. So in Galatians 5 verses 22 through 23, let's look at it. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces. Someone say produces produces this kind of what fruit in our what lives so he produces this fruit in our lives the holy spirit once we have him that's what he'll produce what are the fruits that we should see then love first one off the bat do you love others do you love your enemies do you love that wife that god gave you do you love that husband that God gave you? Do you show love? Do you embody love? When people see you, do they see love? Let's look at the next one, joy. Because some of us really be coming in there just like. Good morning. I love the Lord. Amen. And it's kind of like, okay, where is your joy? Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. So are you embodying joy? When people see you, do they see a joyful person that they want to communicate with? Let's look at the next one. Peace. Some of us, you ever met somebody and... You know, even sometimes ourselves, because we examine ourselves. I mean, you know, you can't step into their way without them being like, oh, Lord, you know, this is wrong. That is wrong. Oh, my goodness, I have this to complain about, this to bring your attention, this, 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 this. No peace. You can't even sleep at night because you have no peace. No peace in your mind. No peace in your body. No peace. In your spirit. RKC online, y'all, y'all getting this? I hope y'all getting this. So the next thing is patience. And that's something that I'm like, God, please work in me every single day, Lord. Like I examine me and I know, yeah, no, like that one, that's a real struggle for me. Because when I want something, I want it now. So do we display patience? Do we display kindness? goodness are you faithful are you faithful to that job you was praying to god about and now you get it now you don't want to be faithful in it are you faithful in your marriage are you faithful with taking the time out to date are you faithful with what god has gifted you are you faithful with your gifts are you faithful with the church you're planted at are you faithful gentleness i mean some of us just rough some of us can't even talk to people because we just too rough relax someone say relax and then (laughs) and then the last thing is self-control and i think everybody lacking a little bit of that if we being honest if we being honest everybody lacking a bit of self-control yeah that one that one So it says, there is no law against these things. 
Because if your life shows no evidence of the spirit, then unfortunately, it simply means that Christ isn't truly in you. And if Christ is not in you, then you failed the test Paul was talking about. And you might be like, wow, that's a really harsh thing for you to say. Like, wow, how could you say that? But Jesus confirmed that true prophets of God are recognized by their fruits. In Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20, it says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. It says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes? or figs from thistles. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Let's look at that. What does that mean? I mean, it's quite simple. If, if the tree is bad, you won't bear bad fruit. I mean, you will bear bad fruit, right? If your tree is good, then you will bear good fruit. So now if you're looking, or if you're being discerning, about your circle, about persons you speak with, about yourself, if you're wondering what kind of fruit I produce in, look at the fruit of your life. If you're looking at what fruit somebody else has, or if they are a wolf in sheep clothing, what are you going to look at? What is their life producing? What is your life producing? Is it producing chaos? Because over time it will tell. You might not be able to see it right away, but after a while, after a season, when the fruit is produced from that tree, what are you gonna see? A bad fruit or a good fruit? Amen? So I want y'all to say this with me. Say the fact is in the fruit. You looking all about worrying, wondering, oh, if this person good to me. Someone say, the fact is in the fruit. So when people see you then, what fruit do they see? Because I'm honestly tired of Christians giving God a bad reputation, giving the Holy Spirit a bad reputation, because you're doing the most. You're posting the most scriptures, and where's the fruit? That's all I'm looking for. I'm not looking for the posts. I'm not looking for what you're saying. When I interact with you, do I feel love? Do I see the patience that I need? Do I see the gentleness that I need? Where is the fruit? Someone say it's time to cut the excuses and start producing fruit. Amen. So principle three, growing pains require us to look at ourselves and not everybody else. Principle three is growing pains require us to look at ourselves rather than looking at everybody else. So rather than cross-examining others, Paul is telling us that we need to stick to examining our own lives in the scripture. What does it say? Examine yourself. It says test yourself. Paul didn't say Oh, you know, examine yourself, test yourself, and then go ahead after you're done with that and look at your neighbor's life and watch your neighbor. He didn't say that. All right? In Galatians 6, verses 4, it says, Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. Because we be wanting God, honestly, to change everything around us, to change everybody around us, but we don't want him to change us. Don't, don't do that in 2023. Don't do that. Because it's easier then to look at the speck in someone else's eye, right? Rather than take the time, energy, and effort to what? Take the plank out of your own eye. It's always easier to look at somebody else's life, somebody else's struggles, than look at your own. So like we say today, someone say, worry about your own self. Say it again, worry about your own self. So principle number four, it says, growing pains birth maturity. 
Growing pains birth maturity. And as we've discovered, growth is uncomfortable, right? Growth is uncomfortable. So when you begin to feel uncomfortable with certain things or a certain area of your life, it's a good indication that you need to grow. It's not bad when you feel a growing pain. Anything that's growing, you're, you know, you're going to feel pain. It's what you do with that pain, right? And when you do what is necessary to grow in that area of your life, you begin to mature not only in life, but you also grow spiritually as well. So how do we know that we're maturing spiritually? Don't worry, I got three points. Three points to cover you. Don't worry, I'm almost done. I got three points to cover you. I came prepared this morning. So if you want to know if you're spiritually mature, let's look. Number one, real simple, real easy. You what? Say it louder. Say it again. Practice what you preach. Matthew 23, verses 3 through 5. It says, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. So you, in other words, you're telling me to do this, you're telling me to do that, but you don't even have the strength to do it yourself? That's weird. Someone say, that's weird. <laughs> right? Everything they do is done for people to see. So have you ever met anybody that don't practice what they preach? Oh, wow. Well, y'all already failed the test. Because what are we supposed to be doing? Examining ourselves. So all my people in the house that didn't say anything. Y'all passed the test. My, my two people that didn't say nothing. <laughs> That was a good one. Oh, my goodness. Someone look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, wake up. You got to pass the test. <laughs> so a person that is maturing spiritually don't only talk about it, but they what? They be about it. They don't compromise or take the easy way out. Instead, they do the hard spiritual work of living out the faith. Don't be the person that is focused on looking good on the outside and desiring people's attention. Instead, desire God's attention. So let's move on to number two. How do I know that I'm growing spiritually? Number two, you search for the truth. You admit the truth to God. And then you also admit the truth to others. The Bible says that the truth will what? It will set you free. So do yourself a favor this year and stop lying to yourself. Stop lying about your struggles. Stop lying about what's in your heart. Stop lying up to yourself. You need to search for the truth within yourself. Read the Bible. The truth is in there. Are you living the truth? And you have to do this every single day to make sure that you don't go off course, right? So spiritually mature persons, when they mess up or miss the mark, like we all do, because nobody's perfect. We see God's truth that is in his word about the situation. We admit what we did to God, which is the spirit of repentance. We repent. Someone say repent. And then we also own up to it if we did something wrong to somebody else or if we are sharing our testimony. We tell others because the Bible says, confess your sins one to another. Hey, yes, what I did was wrong. What I said was out of line. It wasn't from a place of love. Honestly, it wasn't. Because the truth will set you free, and it won't only heal you, but it will heal others. So let's look at number three, and we're almost done. What do spiritually mature persons do? You train yourself daily. Spirit, spiritual maturity takes constant training. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, Paul told them, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Paul made it a practice to test himself. Paul, who is said to be one of the greatest apostles in the Bible, tested his own self. That means nobody is above the test. 
Nobody is above the task. Somebody say, nobody is above the task. Look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you're not above the task. Amen. In fact, we should be proud to tell people, though, that I'm not, I know I'm not perfect. I know how I used to be, what I used to struggle with, and I know what this flesh is capable of. And that is why I have to test myself. I train myself to do so every day. So don't think your daily decisions aren't a big deal because they add up after a time. And after a time, then we see the fruit from that. So the Bible promises that those who constantly work at being righteous and honest will reap the benefits of spiritual maturity. So as I close, I'm getting ready to end it. Don't worry, y'all. It was a hard message this morning. But principle five, the last principle, growing pains require death to self. Growing pains require death to self. We can only want God to be the Savior of our lives without being Lord of our lives. How do we want him only to save us when we're doing something wrong and not listen to him as the Lord of our lives, the principles that he's given to us to govern us? We only want him to save us, but we don't want nothing else from him. So we can't have life without death. Growth requires hard work, and it requires you taking up your cross daily, whatever whatever that your cross may be. So you have to take it up daily in order to grow and be true to the faith. Why do you think Paul didn't give up on the church in Corinth? Paul had faith in knowing that if they would really actually start listening to what God was actually teaching them through self examination that they would grow that there's hope that we all would grow amen if you know that there's still hope for you give God some praise because there is hope that we all can grow if we start putting what we learn on Sundays what we discover in our prayer time in our time with God if we start discovering and reading the word and living it out then we will grow Paul gave them this warning, and you can play something underneath me, Charlene. Paul gave them this warning out of love for them and wanting to see them live out the life God called them to. So this isn't a harsh message. Rather, this is a message of love. Anybody hear a tough love before? Everybody just want love, right? <laughs> it's okay. So he was reminding them that being true to the faith is so much better than pretending and being a counterfeit and being fake and you shouldn't settle for anything less but real and true growth it's painful to grow but you need to embrace the growing pains of life in order to become who God has called you to be you need to make the necessary adjustments to live the true life of faith so the bottom line today is growing pains are necessary to make way for the new do you want to be the same you that you was last year? Do you want to be the same you that you was last week? So growing pains, they're necessary. Stepping away from some friends is necessary. Stepping away from some conversations is necessary. It's necessary in order to grow and make way for the new. So for the remainder of the year, I want you to examine yourself daily. Check your heart, check your behaviors, and make the necessary changes to grow into all God wants you to be. And so that this year will be nothing stopping you. There will be absolutely nothing stopping you into walking into a year of fruitfulness and multiplication. Can I get an amen? Can I get some praise that you're going to embrace the growing pains this year, embrace the changes of life, and examine yourself? with everybody standing. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for this message, God, that needed to be said. God, I pray that it would pierce the hearts of your people this morning. God, and that they would go out and live a transformed life. Father God, that they would be unrecognizable to persons who knew them. God, let their life talk for them.
Let their life speak for them, God. Let us be a people, Father God, that embrace the growing pains of life that embrace the new things that you want to do in us and through us if we just surrender, if we just be intentional about picking up our cross daily, God. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we give you thanks. God, we give you praise. You deserve all of the glory and all of the honor. God, let this message stay with your people. Let it, let it stir up something in their spirit to not want to change, God, but to want to, not, to not want to stay the same. God, but to want to change their entire life. And all God's people say in agreement. Amen. Amen.